some of you who are familiar with, with web experience management, with our solution, have already seen. And there is a number of new things in there that uh, even the ones amongst you that are already our customers have not uh, seen yet. So this is a this is a countdown. So number ten is something that I call install now. Install now is very interesting because if you think of enterprise software and how enterprise software is installed, then it's usually you get the CD or you get the download, but you usually get the guy that comes and installs it for a week, and then a week later maybe it works. And we said it has to be simple. It can't be that in this day and age enterprise software is that hard to install. And we said it has to be as simple as you download the software, you double click it, and really there is no third step. So that should be as simple as it is. And I think we'll say that in the enterprise you install only once and there's a server and then it's done. But that's not true. There's a, there's a wide range of installations that you do when you can. The reason why you install only once is because it's so freaking complicated. So we, we built something that we call a quick start technology, and I'll walk you now through the, through the installation process. So all I need to do from an installation standpoint, I get a self-runnable jar file, I obviously get my license key next to it, and all I need to do is I need to double click it. And that's really all that needs to be done. I cheated a little bit, it takes about three minutes, and I didn't want to make it take away three minutes, so I double clicked it already before to extract it, but the process is exactly the same, except for that it takes uh, around three minutes um, to run the installation. But this is zero interaction installation, and what we're going to see right now is the out-of-the-box installation as we go. And you see when the installation is done, if your browser opens up, obviously if you do that on a Linux console or something like that, you're not going to get the browser open, but other than that, it's pretty much the exact same. So this is all that we needed to install a full-fledged enterprise system that can run some of the most high-traffic websites you can see on this planet. So this is my number 10. We go to number 9. It's something that I call Simply Simple. And this is really something where I had slides for this, slides for this that were describing how the user interface is really, really easy to use. But then I realized that you, you shouldn't really describe the user interface, you should just show it, right? The slides don't really do it. So what I wanted to show you guys is how quickly and easily I can go into the system and make very intuitive changes on a production website. So if we go to, to our website right here, this is what the website looks like for on, on the production side of the house, then I can just quickly go to a particular part of that website and say I want to make a change. To make a change, I'll just open up my sidekick here on the right hand side that gives me all the, uh, all the components that I can use to kind of drag and drop into the system. But at the same time, we want to make sure that all the uh, interactions that I do here are as simple and easy as possible. I can go in here, I can say I want to change this text. This is as simple as it is, text change. And now when people see that, most, of, most people think, hey, this is HTML editing and so forth, but it is not. What I did now is I changed this very isolated object in the content repository store, but it is a very intuitive mechanism for the end user to do it. So you don't give up anything of separation of concerns between content and presentation. This is really all fine-grained separated content. But if we, if we take this a step further, just to give you a little bit of an idea, let's say we want to make this a little bit more complicated, and we want to, let's say we want to have an enumeration or something like that here, and this is as simple as it is. It's really straightforward. Even things like creating a link, for example, which usually, I mean, for many of you who have used some other, uh, some other content management system will see, uh, will see a, a more complicated task. So I can quickly just select the content that I want to link here. I can say I want.
want to select a particular page that I want to link to, and of course I have search at my disposition at any point in time, so if I want to say I want to uh, link this to the circle page, then this is all I need to do. So this is how I create the web. It's as simple as that. And obviously all the, all the features of relayouting and, and dragging and dropping things is just as fast and easy as this. And that's the way I would say how it's supposed to be. So to show you some of the, the graphics uh, rendering capabilities, I quickly want to show you uh, some, some more aspects of this. So let's say we want to um, have a particular picture. Let's say we take that in-flight image. We want to replace this right here. We can just drag and drop these things. Uh, we can open this up. We want to say we want to uh, create a certain cropping area right here, take this portion here, um, and we'll, we'll decide that we want to uh, even rotate that a little bit. So these are these are the changes that I'm making. And keep in mind, all we do here is completely dynamic. The original image is a high-res image that stays the way it is. So this is just a presentation for this particular instance of the image that we're looking at. So things are extremely straightforward, extremely easy to use. We want to add interactive aspects like, uh, uh, for example, like carousel and HTML5 carousel that we just want to add here. And it's as easy as just dragging it on the page. Uh, for example, going to the, the pages here and say we want to place some events right here. Oops, place some wherever they are. Take some events, drag and drop them right up here, and that's literally all I needed to do to get an HTML5 carousel uh, uh, set up. And of course, if I if I don't if I now I click through it because it was linked in secret, but if I if I just want to say, well, I don't care that much anymore, I can just remove that. So this is the way of interacting things. All of the things that I changed now happen in the offering environment and are not published. And as soon as I send that to an approval process that I can very uh, very similarly define, <coughs> it's going to be visible on the public page. So simplicity is absolutely key in this. So this brings me to number eight. And this is how we deal with digital assets, how we integrate into Creative Suite. And after all, we're Adobe. Adobe stands for uh, the Creative Suite products, and I want to show you how we can absolutely seamlessly integrate with those products. So underlying the image that I just used here, we have a digital asset management system. And it's a full-fledged digital asset management system with all the bells and whistles, but you see it's very tightly integrated. There is no seam between the digital asset management system and the and the web experience management system. I see my in-flight picture that I just used right here. I can double click that and deal with all the meta information, with all the renditions, with the versions, the references, all the complexities of the digital asset management system. But what I want to do now is I want to make a change to that, <laughs> to that image. And I obviously want to do that in Creative Suite. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to connect via Bridge to the Digital Asset Management System. And for those of you who don't know Bridge, Bridge is the uh, interface to browse, uh, to browse uh, uh, assets that people use in Creative Suite. So if we go to our travel overview here, and we have a look at our in-flight image right here, and I can just double click it to open it right in Photoshop. For those people who even want to, who even want to uh, 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 work without that, there is a there is a version called Mini Bridge um, that's built right into right into Photoshop right here. So let's say I'm a graphics designer. I want to make a change on that picture. Uh, let's say I want to remove this uh, the, the the flight attendant right from here. And I can very easily do that by, for example, say I want to expand selection a little bit, and I want to hit, um, hit a content aware fill. For those of you who don't know content aware fill, I think it's absolutely amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And obviously, you, you can you can go in here and say, if you want to change something in the file info, for example, you can say, I just removed the flight attendant. Um, and all you have to do is you hit save. I'm a graphics designer, all I do is I hit save. I don't edit the underlying asset. I edit directly onto the digital asset management system. So access control, workflow, protection, versioning, all these things are taken care of. As soon as I do this, of course, Bridge has picked that one up, that changed. Um, but obviously, if I, if I go back into my digital asset management system, right here, and refresh that, you'll see that obviously all the templates have been recreated, my description has been added, so everything happened absolutely seamlessly. Now that's all right, but if we take this one step further and we say, so what happened to that image that we just used on our company page, which was cropped and rotated, and you of course see it's cropped and rotated and the flight attendant is removed here as well. Now this means that everything is layered all the way through, that there is no human interaction necessary to this point. Keep in mind this is not public. This is still all contained in the off environment. We took out all the steps that somebody has to take to, um, to integrate things entirely seamlessly. Now if we want to take this a step further and say, hey, it's not just about images and Photoshop is great, but how about InDesign? So if we go to a page, like for example, the banking services page right here, we have some text here that we can read from geometrics offers an infinite variety of integrated differentiated geometric banking services. And this is text that comes from an InDesign file. So the same way we were able to open the file in Photoshop and Bridge, we can just go to the documents right here and say we want to open InDesign file right from Bridge as well. I claim my benefit of it. So InDesign opens, that file opens, and that's a that's a normal InDesign document the way you'd, you'd expect it. Um, and if we if you look at the display on the website. And so what we do right here is whenever we go in and say we want to make some edits, I'll just put one, two, three, four, five, or something like that in here, um, we sort of operate with this the same way. So whenever something is persisted into the content repository, we'll automatically send it to InDesign server, take it apart in bits and pieces, and all the assets get dissected, including uh, the pieces of content. And of course, if I now go back here, and I refresh this page, then you'll see that this change has automatically been consumed by the, by the website. So it's an absolutely seamless Thank you. I like it too. <laughs> that's a recent t-shirt. That's a sneak preview. <laughs> All right. The next topic is the Adobe Online Marketing Suite. And obviously with the addition of, of Omniture into the mix, we wanted to leverage, uh, leverage all the capabilities that we have in CQ, leverage all the mappings and all the detailed information that we have to allow people to map events that happen into CQ into something that they can track with Site Catalyst uh, including the test and target inboxes for targeting uh, directly into CQ and we wanted that to be as seamless as possible. <coughs> to walk you a little bit through what that means for us, we built a, a very, um, a very, uh, could close all that, a very uh, intuitive interface that allows people to go in and do those mappings for Omniture. It's much easier than spelling it. <coughs> so, if we go to our websites here, we have we, we built in the entire the entire mapping uh, out of the of the uh, of the site catalyst 
variables right into the system and we allow you to map out which portions um, of, uh, of your tracking you want to you want to load up into into C2 elements. And to show you what that looks like, I just quickly want to want to uh, want to show you that because this is usually something that people who have worked with comments will get very excited about because they can essentially say if the user X leaves a comment, I want this to be tracked as this and that variable or this and that event and, and just say how they want various different elements to be tracked in Kinometer. So this is a this is an inside catalyst. So this is a complete user experience um, mapping tool. Now at the same time we wanted to make it really easy uh, to, to integrate that and that's why we did the integration in a way that is absolutely seamless and every website um, that that uh, we ship out of the box as an example has a built-in link to site catalyst and that built-in link uh, should take you directly onto if we're on this page here it will take you directly into site catalyst into the report into the historical report um, for that very page so let's see how fast the network connection is here. But this now takes me directly into Site Catalyst and shows me what's been happening on that page, which is extremely useful for the author because they get to see how their page was used um, without having to navigate into, into that location. There is a lot more to come. There is a lot more components uh, that we're going to put in uh, right there. I can quickly show you what, for example, test and target components look like, so we can quickly go in and say we want to add that component uh, uh, right in here, so we can, for example, say we want to add the test and target component that we ship out of the box right into the right into the system, so I can very easily just go here and say I want to add a new, add the new component, so you have the test and target inbox, you can just drag and drop it. And that's really the kind of uh, interaction that we expect from a fully integrated, from a fully integrated stack. So this was the Omniture uh, online marketing uh, integration. The next one is something that I'd like to call <coughs> forgive me. And it's, it's really something about forgiveness. And I usually say nobody's perfect. We all make mistakes. <coughs> While we're, while we're working, particularly on, on, on websites. So what I wanted to show you is a feature that we missed for so long um, in web applications. And we sort of worked very hard to bring it to bring it back. So let's look for, for a page that is very useful for that. So let's say we want to make some we want to make some uh, some changes here. So we select some of this and say, well, want this anymore, I'll delete those, um, I want to leave a comment here, this and that and the other, and then after a while I move this around, maybe draw some draw some things right here, um, just to indicate what was wrong, and at a certain point in time I realized that this is not what I wanted to do, and in any desktop application when you hit undo and things will work normally, right? In the web, not so much, right? I mean, we're in, in some applications you have a single step undo on the web, but here we actually went out of our way to rebuild the complete undo. So all I do is I hit Control V, and I see that all the steps are coming back. Is that persistent when you close and open a browser? Um, the question is if it's persisted. No, it's not. And the reason we, we thought about how we implement that and we thought it was confusing is like we open and close the document. So it's the question, can you still undo? Probably not. But it's it's something that we technically could persist, but we, we chose not to do it at this point. But we'll, we'll, we'll find it out. We'll have feedback from our users. I think the majority of people would not expect it to be there even. So we'll, we'll have to tell our users you can undo it. Yeah, that's probably the best way of looking at it. All right. So the next thing, and I, I realize that I that I have to uh, accelerate my 
pace a little bit. The next thing is something that I call context rule. We think context as a part of the experience of, of what an end user consumes is absolutely mission critical. It's the backbone of how we want to present our information, our content to the user. We built something that we call the context cloud or the client context, um, and we extended that um, to allow a user to be a lot more visual with it. So this is going to be an area of continued investment. So let me quickly show you how, what that means and, and how that works. So if you think of an experience right here, and I'll quickly uh, go, to, go to preview mode. Um, if you think of an experience like this here, you can always bring up, um, you can always bring up the context of that specific user. And if you, if you uh, want to simulate what this experience looks like for a particular user, like let's say Alison Parker, then you can just bring up Alison Parker's profile and you see what the experience will be for Alison Parker. Now, keep an eye on this information here on the right. This information is targeted here on the right. So what we want to do is we want to say we want to change what the uh, information is like for, for a male person instead. And you'll see that the change is right in place. So you get to experiment and you get to see what these things look like. And you can switch it, you can put the gender change and switch it back. The, um, the, interesting, the interesting thing is, of course, that we have not just a list of information that we have here, but this is a truly extensible integration platform that we built here. Because the things that we found is the most heterogeneous is the information that we have about the users in an organization. So it comes from your CRM system, it comes from your LDAP, it comes from things like, a, like an activity stream on a social site, it comes basically from all the places. So we wanted to build something that makes it really easy for you to go and extend that. So you can at any point in time, if you have the privileges, click the edit button and you go to the edit mode for the context. So you can say, I want new things in the context. And just like in content management, you have the ability to extend that with arbitrary sources. So for example, one of the sources that we put in is a, is a JSONP source, which can be just about anything that you find on the web. web. This can be your geolocation service. And as a matter of fact, the geolocation service that we use down here uh, is one of those. And it's very important to us that you can construct this any way you want to, so you can say, I want this information to be here, um, and you can, for example, say, I want to use this, uh, this location-based service now, and you can say, I want to fetch the store. And that's really all you need to do, and this is a complete third-party service, so we're, we're combining web service information now into the cloud. So this is, this is seriously everything I do, and right here, I'm going to say, I'm going to use another service, I'm going to use Google Maps just display my location, right? And this is literally all I need to do to get geolocation uh, uh, to work. So let me quickly refresh that. And I seem to have broken it. So but generally, this is, this is all I need to do to get to the point where I'm at here. So this is all that's required to display that information there. And then obviously, drive targeting off of it so you can all the information that you have on the left hand side, you can pull in and, uh, and, and use to drive, for example, content all over the page. So it doesn't have to be on the right hand side, it can be across the, the, the entire site. So this is um, the context, very extensible. The next one is something that I call my site. And this is a feature that we had in CQ uh, 5.4 actually prior to that. The problem is that you have an existing HTML site and we want you, especially from the development side, to give you something that uh, allows you to import that site and deal, deal with the import of an existing legacy or HTML that site uh, very efficiently. So what we, what we have here is something that we call the site importer. If I go to the site importer, you'll see that I can just click on our uh, our integrated development environment here. For example. That's interesting. I threw it. I've had trouble with Firefox 7, so I don't know if there's a safari there. 
I think it's something went offline, or at least that's what it looks like, right? It looks like there's no fast <coughs> server. Delete the cookies? I'll try that next. They're very, very odd. Something, something may have switched into offline mode. I don't know. I don't know why. That's weird. All right, so close the browser. Choose IE6. Yeah, <laughs> I love that one. Yeah. That is very odd. Well, I guess Safari a try. Just for kicks. Try clearing the cache. I've seen this before. Yeah. Well, Safari did. So it's got to it's got to be something to do with with, uh, with my browser situation, whatever it may be. Um, so the so the idea is you you go to import site here, and you essentially say I want to take an arbitrary site, and I, I take the uh, Adobe Adobe.com developer connection I think it's called DevNet um, as an example. <coughs> I like the C colon backslash. I've never seen that before. Have you seen this? C colon backslash fake path. That's a good joke. We got, we got Easter eggs in here, apparently. That's funny. They're having fun whenever they send me on demos and they give me something. It's always very They needed a website. Marketing said we need a website. Cyber Competition has a website, and um, they created things in Word and sent it to the webmaster, who created HTML and uploaded it via FTP onto a site. That's how things were done, and precisely for that, people created web content management systems. So if you think of how things, what things look like today in apps, in the apps business, very similar. People need an app because the competition has an app. They don't really know what they're going to do with the app, but they need one. Um, they're not using Word anymore, they're using PowerPoint. They're, the magician that, that creates the app for them is the app developer, and it's not five days, it's really months from, from PowerPoint to deploy the app. Um, and there is the uncertainty of the third party review process. And we said we want to do this entirely differently. We want to give uh, the business user the ability to just publish and synchronize the app just the same way that they do with the websites. So let me show you what we what we do here. So what we what I have here is I have um, an app that has been built by Christoph Conrad, who's one of our uh, Flash evangelists, and I just have the application right here. The application is a mobile trader app, completely built in Air, runs across all the different devices. It's an application the way you'd expect it from an Air application with a lot of interactivity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And now we said, so what happens now if the business user says, yeah, we've got three and Literally, that's all it took. This thing is live uh, now, and you can, you can very easily do it. So this is what the instance looks like. You can go to the authoring environment right here. You see that the DNS that I gave it just shows up here. So literally, this is a production, a production instance. So if the three minutes of installation time were too long for you, we're down to five seconds. Uh, so seriously, this is a fully running, clean cut tenant instance of, of CQ with everything set up from the author to publish replication. Uh, the entire caching is set up the right way. So you can you can not just use the um, the authoring side of it, but this 
is the production publish thing running on 480 with that given DNS name that you, that you gave it. So it's, it's all ready to go. So if we want to take this a little bit further, and we say, well, let's assume we don't have enough CPU power. Right now it's OK. It's not that much traffic on the side yet. Um, but let's say we want to add a cluster node on the publish side. So we want to double the infrastructure that we have for serving up these pages. That's as easy as clicking this button. And that's it. Here's the second box. And it's right here. And this is the elasticity that we get where you really, within seconds, you have this uh, added to the cluster. You have the load balancer splitting up, sending the load to two boxes. And there's really nothing that needs to be done. Can you raise the idea? I know that it's still kind of in early phases, but um, would that allow me to, to select the version that meets the rest the version that I'm running? So let's say I'm going a little bit behind, I'm on CP53, and I want to speed a test environment for my next release. Can I select the version of CPU that will run there? So the question was yeah, if yeah. I, <laughs> the question is whether whether you can run whole versions of CPU and technically technically you can. Obviously we'd also like to uh, use that environment to help you migrate to the recent version. <laughs> so we're more likely to build an import mechanism that allows you, I mean, as part of, of the plan, there is an import mechanism that says, here is my on-premises that I have imported in the cloud. So get all the packages up and, and, and uh, get, it, get it all up and running. There's also uh, things that I, that I uh, wasn't able to show now, um, just lack of, lack of time left. Um, but there are also, also areas where, we, where you can distribute packages across all the different instances. So you have a hotfix from us that you need to install on your sure the instances. Just select it all and install it to all, to all of them. Yeah, that's all just publishing? It's authors and publish, whatever you want it to be. So development, test, QA, anything goes. When, when is that? <laughs> so this is, from, from a timing standpoint, we're shooting for the CQ55 release right now. Um, but it's, it's very important for us to, to give you guys a sneak preview of the, of the technology that we have so you know that something is coming. So if you're interested in this, um, feel free to talk to our uh, product management, a volunteer, Cedric, or Lars, or both of them, uh, for that. Pierre's also here. Sure. Or Pierre. <laughs> See, we have two guys. <laughs> We're good. So the last, the last one and a half minutes um, I'll use for the roadmap and the vision. Many of you may have uh, heard me talk.